whether you want to be or not. No, just kidding. Okay. Um, okay, just do a little test on your end, Greg, to make sure it's picking up your side. One, two, three, testing. One, two, three, testing. Got it. Okay. And okay, I think we're ready to go. Okay, in three, two, one. <clears throat> Hey listeners, I want to welcome you all to a very special podcast that we are recording today. Now, why is it special? Because today we have one of my favorite thought leaders and author of a book that is without a doubt one of my top 10 reads of all time. You know when you find a book or a philosophy or a quote that sings to your soul and changes everything for you? So this author's book actually did that for me. His name is Greg McEwen and he's the author of Essentialism. Essentialism is a New York Times bestseller. It has sold more than a million copies around the world. It's been translated into 25 different languages and voted a top 20 book on leadership by both Amazon and Goodreads. The philosophy, the philosophy of essentialism has been taught by Facebook, Apple, Pixar, Google, Twitter, and I'm sure thousands of other businesses around the world. The ideas and strategies in the book have been featured in Time Magazine, The New York Times, Fast Company, Politico, Inc. Magazine, Harvard Business Review, NPR, NBC, Fox, and The Steve Harvey Show. This book is one book that I couldn't put down when I read it. I've easily recommended it to dozens of people, and I also recommend it to all of you. I've read it twice now and applied the principles for essentialism over years and years of my life, and it will forever be on my bookshelf as a rereadable. So who can get value out of this podcast? And I'm going to answer that question by quoting a passage from Greg's book. It's actually on page four. He says, now, let me ask you this. Have you ever found yourself stretched too thin? Have you ever felt both overworked and underutilized? Have you ever found yourself majoring in minor activities? Do you ever feel busy but not productive? Like you're always in motion but never getting anywhere? So I think that relates to pretty much everyone, and we've all been there multiple times in your life. So if that relates to you, grab something to take notes, you guys. Get ready because without further ado, the author of Essentialism, Greg McEwen. Greg, welcome to the show. How are you doing, my friend? Such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. How did I do with that intro? Is that all accurate? I didn't miss it. it you did it perfectly. Okay. Just, good. just, just people should lower expectations now. You know, that was the best part. <laughs> we're, we're, we're downhill from here. I, I, I beg to differ, man. This is, here's the book, you guys, for those of you that are watching on video, Essentialism. Um, definitely a top 10 read for me. Um, I was a, a, I was an essentialist before I knew what essentialism really was. Um, I think like back in 2006, I came home and I looked in my closet one day and I thought, why is all this crap in here? Like I haven't worn this stuff other than like this sweater that I might wear to a, a wedding or something. Like I haven't worn this stuff in a year. So, so I made that rule. I said, okay, anything in my closet that hasn't been worn in six months is automatically going to go. And that was, that was massive. And then later on I became uh, if you're familiar with the term digital nomad, where we travel the world and work remotely. So I did that for years and literally living out of the suitcase. And, and sometimes I had too much stuff for a carry on suitcase. And it was like, this is stressing me out. I've got to like, you know, you know, weed out some more stuff, but, um, but I, I love the book, man. And, um, and really to cover everything that's in the book, um, and I'm sure it goes even farther, but to cover everything in the book, we would need a four hour podcast, but that wouldn't be very, very essential of us. Um, <laughs> and, uh, literally when I saw this book, uh, and, and maybe you've had these times in your life, Greg, have you ever seen a book where you realize, you know, you're going to like that book and that book's probably going to change your life before you even read it? Well, I, I think I have had that experience, but it's a, it's a great compliment that you're suggesting that as you looked at the cover of this book, that there was yes. something of it that spoke to you, you know, intuitively, emotionally, yeah. uh, even before you get to the content of it. I, I'm really, I love that that was the case for you. Yes. And, and I'm, I'm certain that I know many people that it's also changed their lives as well that have that similar feeling. So, um, and, and that's what it was like to me. So this is the book, you guys, uh, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit for Less. And, um, yeah, before we dive into it, I just want to know, like, how's life, man? Where are you at? Are you doing okay during COVID? What are you doing? Or what are you doing to manage 2020? And we'll dive into like the story later. But how are you, man? Um, great. I mean, I 
I, I feel, I feel like 2020, of course, it's uh, been an unexpected thing. Uh, it's, it's affected everybody. Everybody has been affected, of course. Um, I think that there's opportunity in the madness. Um, I, I myself uh, had a deadline to finish uh, a book by August. Uh, and every day in COVID that I have worked on it, which is, you know, five days a week for sure through the last few months, I have found myself thinking, what was your plan, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it, this, this forced constraint, mm -hmm. the constraints have a great upside. And, you know, if, if you are constrained enough, all you can do is what matters most. Right. And if you, if you respond to constraints in that way, I think sometimes they can be, uh, you know, really productive, really uh, great experiences. And I know that's not true for everyone, uh, but, uh, but for me, it's been, uh, it's been quite a, uh, quite a special time really. Yeah. Uh, and um, I mean, the, the, the other advantage I think we've had, which I think is, just just fortunate is that we chose to homeschool our children a few years ago they went to public school through a spanish immersion program for six years and and then we said okay we'll try one child for one year after some friends of us had a great experience doing this and and th that seemed to go well enough that we said okay well we'll do two years so they were eventually two years and two children and we carried on going like this just year to year thinking well look every time you want to go back you go back and what it meant is that we had several years to adjust to a reality where I'm writing at home and our children are all at home. Mm -hmm. And even with that, COVID obviously requires adjustments, but I really feel for everybody who has had to make that adjustment instead of a five-year change, they had, you know, five minutes to make the adjustment. And so uh, I've, I, you know, personally, we feel like we've, you know, done well. Uh, and uh, we you know, still feel some of the, the, the tensions of this time. Um, but, but really, it's been an opportunity. Uh, and I mean, one of the things that I've learned from it is that this year, particularly for, for people, is like walking at high altitude, hiking mm -hmm. at high altitude, where everything's a little harder than before. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, or a lot harder. But but everything's at least a standard deviation tougher uh, to go to the shops is just a bit harder than before, you know, to, to figure out how work's going to work, to figure out how to navigate your business. Uh, maybe not a little harder, maybe a lot harder, uh, yeah. but that's sort of the, t the, the times we live in right now. Therefore we need a new strategy. Yes. Uh, if you try and simply, well, frankly, if you try to hustle your way fully, like if you do 24 hustle, 24 seven hustle, I don't think it works in a high altitude reality. Mm. Uh, I don't know when the last time was you were in really, really high altitude, but, but, but our family, we went on a, a family vacation last year to Peru and we went up to this, uh, uh, actually, no, I'm thinking of a different trip that we went on, but anyway, same idea. We're, we're, we're up in the mountains and we're so high just walking 10 feet forward yeah. was exhausting. Yeah. Well, if you're in that environment, you can't say, well, that's it. We'll just run up the mountain. We'll just charge ahead. I mean, if you're already exhausted and it's already that sort of environment, you've got to find a different way to make progress. Yeah. And uh, I think that's been, I mean, essentialism, I think is part of uh, uh, an effective response in those challenging times. I, I think like so, so many people that I've talked to whether conscious or unconscious of it, 2020 has been such a good reset for asking the questions, okay, what is essential? Especially totally. like, yeah, especially in, 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 in everybody's world, like, okay, I need groceries, I need some toys to entertain the kids, and I need uh, Netflix to entertain mom and dad, right? To keep people sane throughout, you know, the big, the big, the hard lockdowns. And then it's like, 
okay, who are the few people I need in my life, grandma and grandpa and some friends to make sure at least the quality of our life is sustainable. And in the world of entrepreneurship, I've seen so many entrepreneurs just ask themselves, okay, what are the vital few things we need to keep the business going right now? What are those things that we can focus on? All those other little projects, we can wipe those out. And, and it has been a great system reset for, for humanity um, in all parts of the world, you know, and uh, well, for people that are asking themselves those, themselves those questions and applying them. And, um, and yeah, it's so spot on. Um, so you, you started, so the, 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 the start of the book starts out with you having this, you telling this story of skipping out on the first birth of your child um, for the first birth of your child, the first child, the, when you had your first child, skipping out on that to go to a business meeting. And, um, and then immediately figuring out that you regretted it and then leading you down this path of asking yourself these essential questions. Do you, can you elaborate a bit on that so we can get a, a context for the audience? The, the, I'd received an email from uh, a colleague that said Friday between one and two would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby uh, <laughs> because I needed you to be at this client meeting. Uh -huh. And Thursday night, we went into the hospital. My daughter was born in the early hours of Friday morning. Uh, and so then Friday, you know, it's, it, this, this, this meeting is looming and I'm feeling torn and I've got my laptop and I'm feeling, how do I keep everybody happy and how do I navigate this? And I'm straddling everything. And, uh, and then, you know, to my shame, I go to the meeting. Um, and afterwards I remember my colleagues said, look, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. And the look on their faces didn't really evince that sort of respect or confidence. But uh, even if that was right, it is really plain and clear that I made a fool's bargain. Uh, what I learned personally from that was if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, you know, that has, uh, certainly in part given fire for the deed, uh, to go out, to write essentialism, to research it, to understand why it is we prioritize the way we do, why we operate in the way that we do. Uh, and, uh, essentialism, you know, was the output of that. And then I've had the opportunity to you now teach and coach. Uh, people all over uh, in, in many industries and in many countries, uh, th these simple ideas. So I found that it's not really just a business phenomenon. It's not a US only phenomenon. It's not even a Western phenomenon. It's a, it's a really, it's a human phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, and, and the state of the world, you know, even prior to COVID, and it's still true now, is such uh, that if we're not careful, we will get into uh, a non-essentialist cycle uh, yeah. where we just become more and more busy. I mean, now it looks a little different than before, but the, the, the tensions underneath are the same. It's a, a sleep, uh, eat, Zoom yeah. world that we're in now. Uh -huh. Or as somebody pointed out, when I said that to somebody recently, they said, well, actually, you probably have to get the order different. It's like Zoom eat, sleep. <laughs> uh, it, right. you know, it, Zoom is even greater than the... And, and I think they're right. I mean, there's for a lot of people now, uh, there's no natural boundaries. So work just carries on, carries on and on. There's no end. Uh, there's not that you don't even get in the car and go see a client. You don't, uh, so, so you, you don't end at five, at six, seven, eight, nine, you're still going. It does not. And, and this isn't, this isn't a a really good sustainable way to live. I mean, when you look down at your fitness at the end of the day and it says 300 steps, uh, yeah, and, and that becomes a norm, but that's not great. Right. Uh, and so I, I see, um, I see that this idea of prioritizing your life, uh, has, you know, perhaps the power of relevancy right now, even more than before COVID, but, but, uh, but it seems to, seems to resonate with a lot of people, you know, beyond just me. I always wondered when I read that story, um, how, how your wife felt about you going to the meeting. Yes. Well, you don't have to wonder about it anymore because the very okay. first episode of the essentialism podcast is a conversation right. between me and Anna <laughs> in which I pose that precise question to her. And I was a bit nervous doing it because we, this, we started the, the, the podcast 
it was supposed to be with my wheelhouse partners it is with them, but it was at a time when no one could meet. And so we were like on sketchy microphone, uh, not knowing what we're doing, not knowing any formatting brand new to it. It was a very uh, particular, you know, that kind of um, scrappy way of starting. Yeah. And so we started this, uh, but, uh, and we didn't know where we were going with it. We didn't create a plan or a structure. We just started talking to each other. And, uh, but in the end, I, I thought, yeah, we just got to start there. There's, there's no other place. We need Anna's point of view and her feelings uh, about that moment. And uh, people can go and listen to it. Uh, I won't do it justice to try and summarize her words. You're going to put us on the hook and make us go listen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Let's, let's jump in. Like, so if you guys, you guys watching on video, you can see, uh, if I do this here, see my book. Like literally I have dozens of highlighted uh, passages throughout Greg's book there. You can see quite a few. So I'm going to buzz through some of my favorite ones and just kind of talk about them with you, Greg. And um, so the first, like you, one thing I appreciate about, appreciate about this is you dive right into it here. It's on page 15. You start talking about decision fatigue and the more choices we are forced to make, the more, uh, the more the quality of our decisions deteriorates. And this is a thing that's outlined in today's world. Like there's even an, an analogy amongst the millennials, I think, with FOMO, like fear of missing out for this other event or this party or this engagement or this business idea or whatever it may be. Um, and then they have an even newer uh, analogy um, for JOMO, joy of missing out. And that's one I've been applying on a regular basis since I heard it, um, you know, not going to that party or that networking event or, or pursuing that opportunity or starting that new business idea, uh, which many entrepreneurs are very guilty of trying to do. And, well, and I just, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt you, although, even though I am, uh, uh -huh. because, because the, I just interviewed Patrick uh -huh. McGuinness, who's the person who came up with the term FOMO. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. And so he's written a book of the same name and he's a, another interviewer in, in you know, podcast episode, oh, Patrick McGuinness on FOMO. And it was fascinating to hear uh -huh. how, how he, you know, came up with that and he has the, the best mic drop moment in any party because he gets to say, well, yeah, I, you know, I came up with a word, I published a word that, <laughs> that is now in the dictionary. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not many people get to be able to just launch that, but hearing him and his journey was really fascinating about, I mean, he's thought about that term FOMO for longer than anybody else, deeper mm -hmm. than anybody else. And, and I found myself, you know, definitely educated by him. Oh, that's phenomenal. Okay. So there's another episode we need to check out on, on uh, Greg's podcast. So, so where, can you tell us about a time you had decision fatigue and, and kind of maybe your process of working through, um, that decision fatigue and the light at the end of the tunnel, how the results on the backside of that? Well, I've, I was once taught by a mentor that if you can't point to an example of a principle in the last few days, you, you're not living it. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I want to try and draw from that and think about right now. Um, I, I think I just mentioned it already, but just finished uh, writing uh, a new book. And, and as I finished that, right, August is the, the end of August. Um, I felt as I was coming out of monk mode, a natural, not just a pressure to get to, you know, maybe backlogged emails or so on, but I was operating at such a high intensity by that point. I want to well, take advantage of it. Just take on the next thing. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's run. And Anna was, was wise enough to suggest, well, maybe, maybe you should take a couple of weeks uh, and let's together, let's, let's create proper space to talk, to think, to dream, to plan that. And, and especially that word dream was a, a really great word for her to put on the table because there's a big difference between productivity and being an essentialist. Mm -hmm. You know, productivity is doing more, just keep doing, do the next thing, do as much as you can. Being an essentialist is about doing the right things. Mm -hmm. In order to discern the difference, you have to create space. And so what I did is practically how I approached that is the first thing I did is I looked at the calendar over the next two or three weeks and 
I noticed, first of all, there was more scheduled than I realized mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of stuff had been pushed there because I was finishing up the book. My assistant I just scheduled it after that deadline mm -hmm. date. Secondly, I thought, well, I'm just going to book everything that I can, every space I can that is currently not booked, I'm going to book right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask my assistant, and I'm going to make the commitment myself, don't put anything else on the calendar, right? So that nothing else adds. Uh, and then let me go through every single thing and uncommit. See if I can't push this out a little longer. Um, and the benefit of doing that, for all I know, for all I know, this was rescheduled. I don't even know. Um, this was, but yeah. <laughs> there you go. So you were, you were a part of this process, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, but the power of it was unbelievable. I felt like I was having a rebirth in essentialism. That, yeah. that was the upside of it. I felt like I was experiencing what other people talk about experiencing when they read essentialism. And I'm, I'm an aspiring essentialist all the time, but it was a, such a distinct experience to just go, um, to, to be able to take every new request and weigh it carefully and to be able to start discovering a renewed way of living, a different way of living where you are creating space to think and dream and talk and imagine what's next and how could we do it. And, and, and you, that non-essentialism, begets non-essentialism right begets busyness uh so so you you don't notice it's happening because you're so busy right and so you just run from a meeting to meeting to meeting zoom call to zoom call every and and you think you're doing the right thing because look how much i'm doing but the most important things might not even be getting into your mind yeah. Because you're in such a productivity mindset. Yeah. And my, my essentialism isn't doing more things. It's doing more of the right things. Yeah. And, and that is the key. So creating just space. I mean, it's not, it, it's not easier than that, but it's not more complicated than that. Yeah. To me, to me, this is, this is what I, I could have easily fallen into pretty heavy decision fatigue. And this was a way of clearing my head and clearing mind. And then in that, more relaxed state, great ideas and insights have come and are still coming. Well, I love the the part in your book when you talk about the um, the word priority wasn't even plural until the early 1900s, right? It was just a singular word talking about one thing for 500 years. And then all of a sudden, somebody's like, oh, we need more than one priority. And, um, and it really makes sense. And even though we probably all have more than one priority in our life, right? Like we, we have, well, we all, you, go ahead. No, no, you asked me a question. No, I was just going to say like, how do you, so, you know, my priorities are spiritual life, uh, family health and work in that order. Right. So how does that work out for you? Um, referring to that, uh, you know, how do you manage those priorities or priority? Yeah, look, we, we, can, we all have more than one important thing. Yeah. We can have multiple goals. We can have multiple important projects. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not contradictory to have multiple activities that matter. Yeah. But the, the use of the word priority is just so useful to have a word that means the very first one. Yeah. And that's the whole point of the word the priorist thing, priority, singular, one thing. And yet people say, and I'm sure most people watching or listening to this have been to a meeting where somebody said with no sense of irony at all, you know, here are my 37 priorities. And they actually do seem to mean all of it has to be done first, now, yesterday. <laughs> and, and so, and, and hustle culture doesn't always help with that. Right. You just, everything matters. Everything's important. Everything's urgent. We got to do it all now. Well, you can't do everything now. So all you're doing is producing great stress and a lot of the time reducing your ability to clarify what matters. So one very concrete thing that you can do, um, actually a, a consultant and entrepreneur emailed me about this recently. They'd read Essentialism several years ago and what they had taken away was which actually isn't written 
uh, in essentialism I, is to ask every day the question, what's the most important thing to do today? Right. So I write similar things, but not exactly that. Um, and, uh, and so what she did, she started asking this question every day. Maybe she puts it up somewhere. She's reading it every day. What's the most important thing to do today? At first, it was all business things. She's a consultant. She, uh, you know, she's an entrepreneur. And most things were to do with this client or that client. She said slowly over time, she found the same question produced different answers. Uh, it started to be, well, maybe something to do with self-care, something to do with, in fact, she sent me uh, a photograph. I've never had anyone do this before, but she sent a photograph of herself before and after. It's a pretty shocking thing, actually. Mm -hmm. the, first, the picture before is of someone who is not just you know, mentally and emotionally tired. You can be emotionally and mentally tired inside and still put on a facade outside but she it had broken all the way through to physically how she looked and and, and she was physically unwell mm. and she's shown the picture of the after and the after she just looks you know normal and fine it's not like it's not like one of these i don't know it's just a fascinating picture to me of how exhausted she was before how beaten up she was how fatigued she was uh, and, and 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 the after but then she adds to this, this little story. She said that, that as this evolved, she found herself having sometimes being surprised at the answer that would come to her. Mm -hmm. uh, her, her father calls her one day. Her mother is in hospital. Um, she'd been in hospital a couple of weeks before. You know, she said, well, do you want me to stop what I'm doing and come? And he said, oh, no, don't be silly, dear. You know, you've got too much on your plate and everything's fine. It's no big deal. But she told me that she remembers precisely where she was when he's having this conversation. She knows, she remembers what the weather was like, everything, it like stands still. As she just knows the most important thing to do today is to drive, it's a two hour drive uh, to, uh, to the hospital to be with her mother. So she does that. Uh, she, she, she gets to sit down with her mother. She says, look, I love you. You know, I'm sure everything's gonna be fine. Her mother says, I love you. And, and, she doesn't look so sure that everything's going to be fine. Within one hour, she slipped into a coma uh, and she, uh, she, mm. she dies a week later. So that yeah. is the last time she gets to talk to her. And she said, if I wasn't an essentialist, I, I wouldn't have made that decision that day. Wow. And yes, wow to that precisely. And it, and it touched me um, to hear that story, to hear that application of essentialism. And so this all comes back to the idea of managing priority. And I think a very practical, powerful way illustrated by Joe is, uh, is just to ask every day, what's the most important thing to do today? Maybe even write it down. What's the most important thing to do today? You can still make a list of everything else, but think about what your essential mission is for right now. And just keep coming back to that question day after day. I think it can be life-changing over time. I, I find a lot of value out of writing, writing those down and just numbering them like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then cross out all of them except maybe one or two. <laughs> Don't always do it, but when I do it, it, it applies really well. Um, real quick, Greg, I think your mic changed back to computer audio. And uh, if you want to switch it back to the, the regular let's, mic. Let's sort that. Yeah. Give me a second. You're back. I'm back now. Does that yep. sound better? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, um, he, oh, here's, here's something I love here. Uh, you talk about in the book, we need, we need space to escape in order to discern the essential few from the triv trivial many. Unfortunately, in our time-starved era, we don't get that space by default, only by design. So um, there's, there's this quote here that you said, in order to focus, um, we need, let's see, I can't read it backwards. In, I'll, in I'll read to, it for you. You put yes, it up and okay. I'll read it. Okay. In order to have focus, we need to escape to focus. There we go. I had a guy on the podcast uh, one time and he said this quote and it, it stuck with me. It says, it, he said, um, um, you're never going to be fully on if you're never fully off and you're never going to be fully off if you're never fully on. And uh, same, same thing, just uh, written a little bit different. And time and time again, like people come to me, clients, friends, and just talk and just ask like, you know, I'm just exhausted. I've got so much stuff going on. Um, and, and so in our relationships, in our personal relationships, 
we do, we're doing well if we create boundaries in those relationships, right? You've got boundaries with your, your spouse. You've got boundaries with your children. You've got boundaries with, with everything. But a lot of times with our work and businesses, we don't, we don't create boundaries with those, right? And that's exactly, I would guess, that what that quote's referring to. Maybe we can talk a little bit, Greg, about like how you create boundaries in your life through all different areas to make sure that you're not getting overwhelmed and you're staying essential. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like I'm <laughs> just overdoing it on the podcast, but the fact is, is this, this is where, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm having some of these really meaningful conversations. And one of them recently was with Ben Bergeron, who's, um, he, he, he trains uh, CrossFit uh, superstars, uh-huh. basically he trains the fittest people in the world. He's an Ironman athlete himself. Uh, uh, um, and, and, I had heard about him when I was on someone else's podcast. They talked, they said, oh, do you ever heard of Ben Bergeron? I hadn't, but he, they said, oh, well, Ben, he's a total essentialist and you should definitely talk to him. And they said, what he does, one of the things he does is it, it, is it when it, it goes at 5.25 at night, when he's at the office, he will leave whatever meeting he's in. Unapologetically, he just starts packing up like and that. he's just walking to the door and he's literally getting to the door. And at 5.30, he is just literally out of the door, no matter what. Yeah, like they, said, they said, they said, so I was really intrigued by this. So I, so I look him up and we get introduced and I have him on there. And, and he did one of the things he did, which is fascinating is that he selected what his, you know, his essential values are. He chose five. And he did this in a Google doc. And the second column, he identifies uh, metrics that would, that would show whether he's really doing that Okay. Value. Mm-hmm. So his first value, uh, it's evolved over time, but it became family first. And he had five criteria, you know, metrics that he could measure. And one of those was the item that I just mentioned. Uh, he knew he wanted to be home by six o'clock on the dot. And that meant he had to be leaving a meeting at 525 because it took 30 minutes to drive home. Yeah. All right. So this, this, I asked him, so you know, how often have you done it? So about a three year period that he was keeping this uh, this stock in place, he did it 75% of the time. Okay. Which I just love because that's like for real, you know, like we know the date, he really did it. And, and even before I knew the specific system he had, I felt inspired uh, partially because I had in my head that this man does a hundred percent of the time, you know, like it, 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 I felt inspired by this other essentialist to be more essentialist myself. Yeah. And so in COVID, what, what I chose to do is I said, okay, five o'clock, I am going to walk out of this office and I will announce like a town crier to the family <laughs> what time exactly it is. Uh-huh. And so, you know, if it's 501, that's what I'm yelling. 501, if it's 459, 459. And I am trying to make it so that it's not later than five. And it's awfully fun to do it. Uh, you, know, they, you know, other people, you know, they know it's a bit of fun, but it also signals to people that there's an actual end time. And for me, it gives an excuse to do it because without the excuse, what difference does it make? You say, well, it's 5.30, 5, 6, 7. So why, why stop at 7? Is it 7.30? And <laughs> then why, why at 8, 9? And on it goes. You know, there's no natural end. Mm-hmm. And so this is one of the ways that I have set boundaries, particularly in COVID, uh, that has been fun. But it's, it's had, you know, some pretty useful benefits to it. Right. I always use the story of, like, I, I grew up shooting bow, bows and arrows. And if you want to, you know, fly fast and be and hit your target like uh, an arrow does you need time when that bow is not stressed strenuated strenuated stressed out when that when that bow is pulling back right and that's the build up to it and then you let it go and then you fly same thing like we need time off and that that takes me to the next point here that i want to talk and talk about that so few people really ignore and and you say the quote here is play doesn't just help us to explore what is essential it is essential in of itself and richard branch and even says play is a responsibility we need to nurture that mm-hmm. on a regular basis right and so few adults really play and then quite often if they do play it's with probably drugs and alcohol or mm-hmm. in an unproductive unproductive habits on on um, habits that, that uh, are destructive. And so how do you play, Greg? Like, uh, you know, maybe you're setting your time off stamp at five o'clock so then you can go play the kids. But what are some of the essential things you do in your life, um, the, the playing activities? Um, I, I've recently started to, to try to 
get out at four instead of okay. five, not as an official thing. It's just, you know, when, when, it, when it works, when I can do it so that I can go and swim, swim in the pool with my children and you don't have to have an agenda because games will be created. And so my children love the play in the pool. Actually the wrestling in the pool has become quite, uh, quite dangerous for me. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they've all, they've all become bigger, uh, you know, and they've been wrestling me for longer. I mean, when they were all really little, you could, you, your, your job was just not to, to you know, to keep everybody alive. Yeah. Uh, now, now no one's trying to keep me alive. So we have, we have <laughs> it's its own new sort of challenge. Uh, but the, but wrestling in the pool and playing or playing volleyball in the pool uh, or or you know or just other kinds of play. I mean, you don't think of it maybe quite as play, but going for a walk. I went for a walk for an hour with my wife this morning, and we're trying to do that every day. Mm -hmm. That is enormously valuable. Mm -hmm. Disconnect from being plugged in, from being always on, and the you know you complementing your arrow. Uh, bow and arrow analogy the the paradoxical advantage of play is that in play you have breakthroughs mm -hmm. and in your relaxed state new insights come to you that actually help propel you forward more so it's just such a con that by being on meaning being plugged in being on a screen for 24 7 is actually the way Right. To, to break through to the next level. Uh, I, I'm not at all convinced that that is the case. Mm -mm. No, you're 100% right. I'm, I'm actually working with a brain doctor now about, uh, and the reason why I started working with him is so I could scan my brain and get more productivity juice out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Build business and be more productive and this sort of thing. And I've, so I've been working with him for about seven months and have done four scans. And the last mm. scan he said, cause I've, I've burnt myself out of a couple of businesses to the point where I just can't work anymore. It's just, there's nothing left. Like I can't even do it. Mm. And to the point where I've been in bed from fatigue as well wow. on, on a consistent basis. And so um, I wanted to figure out like what's happening in the brain to make that happen. And he said in this last scan, he goes, you're, you're probably on the verge of uh, burning yourself out again. And mm. your brain is really reacting very well to play. And so he said, go be more social, do more play activities. It's now doctor's orders. You have to that sort of thing. Go on vacation, you know, stop adding more stuff to your to do list. And um, our brains, uh, for the neuroscientists, geeks out there, our brains are really reacting um, very well and, and a lot of times healing themselves, healing, healing itself when you go play, when you take those hard stops, when you go have fun, when you go enjoy times with uh, good friends and, and, and great uh, social events together, um, hanging out with the family, you know, um, taking true vacations where you're not checking your phone all the time, this sort of thing. Um, so very, very spot on, very healthy for us. Um, okay. I, we Go can ahead. riff on that. We can riff on that. I mean, yes. what you just said is so profound and it, it's so, so aligned with the research I've been doing and then been, uh, writing up mm -hmm. in, in this, uh, this new book is, is that when, well, let me ask you this. Now we're slightly off topic to do this, but yeah, if you think about all of the leaders you've ever worked with and all the entrepreneurs who, who basically say, which is almost inevitable that they will say it, some idea like we need to improve our results, mm -hmm. right? Like, Cause even if your results are great, there's always a next level, always, yeah. always, always. So that's a pretty typical thing for a, a driven entrepreneur to want. Okay. So we need to get gr better results by what, Okay, let's give you two options, A and B. Either by working harder or B, by making it easier. Mm. What's the ratio between the two in your experience? Uh, well, it's significant, right? It's huge. Working harder and making it easier. Yeah, which so, would you say, which would you, if you 100% between the two, what's the ratio between those two options? Of the of the entrepreneurs you've worked with, what they would say if they had to fill in the blank. We need a oh, better results by. Most people would choose two. working harder. Yeah, most, give me a number. I would say like at least eighty percent, maybe yeah. more. 
Yeah. It's, it's a good answer. There's no right answer. I'm just curious about how you would, how you would see it. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just interviewing, um, having a conversation with the general manager of an F NFL team yesterday. And I asked him that same question. It just came up because it's in my, you know, it's what I'm thinking about now. And, and his answer, he's like, wow, I don't know, ratio, I don't know, a percentage, I guess you're looking at percentage. He's like, it was just always hard. It was, it was so clear that there was no other answer, uh -huh. that he'd never heard anyone else talk about. It was just like, every, 100%, everybody, that's the way. You have to hustle your way to success. We even say it all the time. We think of it that way. Well, why if there's an alternative strategy? And what if particularly... What if particularly you've already worked as hard as you can work? Mm -hmm. And what if you're up against that line? Exactly. The, parrot, the, the irony is that in the time that we're already exhausted, we often think the answer is to push mm -hmm. even harder. And, and, and I just think that's, I find it so fascinating. And I, I think there is an alternative. Yeah. And that is to find an easier path. What if there yeah. was an easier path to break through to the next level? What, what, if, what if you can get great results? without burning out yeah. by changing your mindset. It's not work harder, it's find easier. Yeah. Uh, this is very much in my mind right now. I think we're taught that by, so like if you imagine, say just a movie about football, right? And American football. And, and you know, in the, the final scene, what does everybody do? They're exhausted. And if they just push a little bit harder, then they can win the Super Bowl or the championship or whatever. Right. right? Or these war movies, too, you know, and, and war people really have to do that. Um, and so subconsciously, we're taught that. And, and probably there's a time or two that we need to do that uh, in our lives. But more often than not, I would say like maybe 95 maybe 99% of the time we need to step back and figure out what the easier route is, right? I, I completely concur that there are clearly rhythms. There are times when a big hard push is really helpful. Yeah. Uh, but the idea that that becomes the norm, yeah. that all the time you should be pushing yeah. seems really unnecessary unwise and actually makes getting your results harder yeah. to get it pushes them away yeah. there's a, there's an amazing story I mean, it's been written about elsewhere but but i went back to the original you know the sourcing of the story and i researched it recently about about the race to the south pole mm -hmm. uh this is from uh, captain scott from england and then uh, amundsen from the the the, the um, the last Viking he was called uh, from Norway. And they both set off on almost identical days. Uh, they, they took their teams. They went on this. At the time, this was, this was the equivalent of the moonshot. I mean, right. no one had ever done it in a millennia. It had never been achieved, not by all the Vikings for thousands of years, everything. No one had made it to the South Pole. It's just so, so difficult, so challenging. Well, the team that makes it is, uh, is Amundsen's team. And his approach he averages, he, he said 15 miles. That's what we do every day. Mm -hmm. On the good days, that's what we do. On the bad days, that's what we do. He has this upper and lower bound and it's like basically 15 days. Maybe on the hardest days, it's 13 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, are the, are the best days though, and that's part of the, the cleverness of his approach is on the best days when he could do 30, 40, even 50 miles on the best days, he would still say 15, including the last three days. So imagine, Three days before reaching the South Pole, you do not know if you're the competitor team is ahead of you or behind you. You have no idea. You are 45 miles from the South Pole. You can do it in one day. If you push, if you force yourself hard enough, you can get the whole way. Right. And increase your likelihood of getting there before the other team. And still on those three days, they average 15 miles per day. They still that. do it in that consistent way. As it turns out, they make it there two weeks before the other team they win and they get their whole team back the 3500 miles back home safely to, to norway whereas in the other team uh has a completely different approach it's a it's a it's it's like on the good days they just trash themselves they go as far as they mm. possibly can so that means on the bad weather days they're exhausted yeah. they're going into the bad days exhausted so they don't even leave the tent yeah 
and they're so burned out inside, they just look out the tunnel. Oh, it's no chance. We can't make any progress today. And so they bemoan the w- bad weather days more than the other team because they're more exhausted. Yeah. The, 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 so their peaks are higher and their values are lower. And actually, over time, what that means is that they made far less progress. And on the way back, they're exhausted, discouraged, uh, and they all of them die on the way home. Not all oh, of wow. them make it home. Oh man. This idea of pacing is an under emphasized message for entrepreneurs. I mean, it's almost unheard of message for entrepreneurs. The, the, the story we're being sold is 24 seven hustle. That's the way to be successful. And I'm not saying you don't have to work and be focused, but pacing yourself yeah. is actually the key. Yeah. It's to be able to not just be up for it for a day or a week when you launch the idea and you're excited about it. It's just to keep going day after day consistently over a long period of time. And it's extraordinary the results that come from such consistency. That is how you get breakthrough, extraordinary results. Spot on. I love that. Um, I, I wanted to ask about, uh, so you start talking about, and about halfway through the book, um, having hell yes decisions. So mm-hmm. hell yes decisions um, was a TEDx talk. And I think Derek Sivers put it on and he was talking about it's either a hell yes or a no. If it's not a, if it's not a hell yes, if it's not a 10 out of 10, then yep. you close the door and you go forward. But I, I've come to the point, um, to points in my life where I have two hell yes decisions, which mm. are so good and so juicy that it takes me months to, to filter through those decisions to figure out which, which direction I should go. Have you ever had two hell yes decisions that have, have made you stuck or that, you know, have made you feel felt stuck. And then what did you do to about them? Do you have such a situation now? I did until about two, three months ago. How did you resolve it? I chose one and I just followed that and it worked out well. And so I just let the other one fall off. Hmm. Uh, Did you feel like you could have made the decision earlier? Did the information you gained in the interim period help you in making that decision? Or did you feel like you had the information as you know, you really in the end just had to choose? I think I had to choose and test it out in order because they were both really great ideas and, and still part of me has that other idea, you know, back here in the safe, just in case, just in case, you know, something turns around and more time does open up and I want to pursue that, that project. Yeah, I, I think you, I think you've approached this in, in a smart way. I mean, I living as essentialist doesn't mean I don't have more than I want to do than I can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always have way more that I want to do than I can do. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the techniques that, that I've used, um, and both Anna and I both use it is, is that we'll, we'll say, okay, here, here are all the projects that are, are yeses for us. These are, these are great things, but there's a, there's a, you know, we have them in storage. And so each month we're looking through them and we're thinking through and carefully curating which ones come next. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I don't think you should be afraid of having two or 10, have as many as you like, you know, definite yeses, but don't try to even do all of those at once. Right. Because, because you, you won't be able to do it. And so that's one way to, to, I think to prioritize is to say, okay, I can only do one. I can only do one of these big projects. I can't take them both on or, or uh, out of the 10, I can't do all 10. So here are the, the, the one or two I'm going to take on next. And, and that's how I tend to think about these. I don't, I, I, my guess for you is that the two decisions you're talking about, the fact you chose the one you chose is probably quite significant. Mm-hmm. That's my guess. Um, well, it's just making more money. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's, so that's significant. But the yeah. reason I say significant is that the, what we actually choose to do, what we're actually attracted to in the end is revealing yeah. something I w I would have probably done with you right here and now, if you hadn't yet made the decision between the two is just tried to create a forcing function. Did you have 10 seconds to choose or you lose both? Mm. You know, you, you, you just make the choice. Of course, you can't live your whole life like exactly that way. But as you, if you've already thought about it, if you're moving into the place of overthinking it, 
my experience is that people do already know the answer. They're just not quite have actually used that moment of focus to just make the decision. Yes, this is the one. Yeah. And in that moment, that's what I see as significant is you did make a choice between the two after having wrestled with them. That's not like the same as going, well, they were both tens and I just happened to choose this one. I think what it probably means is that one was a pretty clear leader. Yeah. And the other one you may come back to, and that's fine. Uh, I, I think that when you have the two forcing yourself to make a choice and just is, is a perfectly reasonable thing. I mean, in a way, in a way you're guessing. Uh, and and, and I, I think overthinking can be quite a, quite a non-essentialist curse. You're right. Uh, and, and it was stressful. It. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, it's, it's, it's make a decision, force yourself to make the decision and go with it and learn by doing it. Yeah. Uh, it seems, seems to me reasonable. You, you, at some point, let's say 80% clarity, 80% uh, information. You say, okay, that's it. I'm going to make a decision with this because it's so costly to go from 80 to a hundred. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying make decisions with, 5% information, but after you've gone through a process of thinking and here are two options, make a decision. If necessary, flip a coin. I mean, literally just choose one so that you can go rather than straddling longer and longer between two options. Uh, and, you know, the old phrase, uh, you, you know, he who tries to go after two rabbits loses both. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, not yeah. saying that right, but the idea is there. Yeah. You're not going to catch two rabbits. So making a choice seems to me sensible after somebody's done a done done some thinking about it that makes total sense because i always i tell friends and clients and all the time i tell them okay if if you don't have the decision in five minutes and the person you love most in the world dies and right, right? yeah right. And, but i just give people 10 seconds <laughs> that's, that's even better but i wasn't even taking my own advice and, and sometimes you know we have those blinders on for our own because we're just so emotionally tied to these two great options that we can't even see take our own advice, you know, and we need other people in our life to hold us accountable to that. Right. Have you, have you heard of the, the, um, of the monkey with the nuts? Have you, have you heard about this? It's a, it's a metaphor, it. yeah. well, so it's a metaphor, right? And I always thought it was just like, you know, wives tale that's not really real, but, but I've, I've seen it on YouTube now actually done someone's, someone did it. Um, and anyway, the idea is that <clears throat> one of the ways you catch monkeys is that you, you create a hole uh, of some kind that that's the trap. And inside that is uh, some nuts. Okay. So on the YouTube video of this, where this has actually been done, it's like kind of on a hill uh, and there's this hole that's been burred out and nuts are inside of it. And the, the, the monkey runs along and it puts their hand inside to get to the nuts. Well, once you've held the nuts, your hand, your fist is too big to come out of the hole. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. So you're trapped in there and literally, I mean, I've seen this now in my own eyes, so it's not even just a metaphor. And, and they just will not let go of this thing. And uh, in this instance, what happens is that they, they, the way that he gets them out is he puts, he puts a trap around them. <laughs> uh, and, and so suddenly he's so distracted by this little this rope around his neck, he like suddenly freaks out and is focused on this and lets go. <clears throat> I'm just using that, I think, here as a parallel uh -huh. for... We just need to let go of something. Otherwise we're trapped. Yeah. If we want to go after, you can't do both. In many instances, you would not do a good job at both. Yeah. And so taking some time and making, but really knowing at the end of the day, you will not do all of them. Uh, facing the reality that you cannot do all of them uh, and, and being therefore more strategic rather than just letting circumstances dictate it for you is a really empowering thing. And the cost of it is just a little bit of time to think through it. And then, uh, then being willing to make decisions with 80% information and learn by having made the decision. The word decision comes from the Latin to cut or to kill. You right. haven't made a decision until you have chosen not to do something for now. Put it back, wait for it. We'll come back to that a different, a different month, a different quarter. But for now, a priority project for this month is X knowing that is hugely liberating yeah. um, because you know, you'll actually make progress on something that, uh, that really matters. 
you, you touch on this in the book, uh, actually quite a bit, but um, I always, I always used to say like my commitments equal my freedom. Um, and that's a perfect example. When, when you are committed to the one thing, you free up the thought process of letting anything else come into your life and you can put all your time and energy into that same thing like getting married like once you get married um you you when you're in a committed relationship you no longer have to distract yourself with dating or other types of people <laughs> so that you true can, right and that's that's a whole big world and that commitment actually creates more freedom in your life um, but that goes along, like you talk about, we talked about boundaries, you know, setting boundaries in all the different aspects of our lives in order to do that and then have processes set up to weed through those. What are, what are some of your top of mind, maybe some, uh, even some, some processes you go through that you haven't touched on in the book or your top of mind, um, processes that, that really help you weed out through decision-making and get more focused and clear these days. Um, I mean, one of the things that I, I love to do is, is um, gratitude lists, uh, particularly once a week uh, where, you, uh, where you can see with better perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, that's one that doesn't sound an obvious way to prioritize, but I feel like it's a, such a, a helpful way to restore perspective if you for example if you if you start to um, if you don't see all the things that are going right you can produce more uh, reactive frenetic frantic behavior that you feel behind I got to fix everything. I got to do it all. I got to fix my business. I got to fix my, my family. I got to fix the house. I got to fix it. Everything needs attention now. And I think that's what ingratitude produces is it can produce just this, this lack of perspective. And, and so then you, you feel like you have to, everything is, everything is going wrong. Everything needs your attention. I find that gratitude is a very calming, um, a tonic for me and restores perspective so that I say, oh, lots of things are going great. So you help to relax and, and in that more relaxed state, you can discern better and prioritize more sensibly. And, and, and it's hard to prioritize in a state of frantic, stressed, overthinking, overstrung, that, that, you're not going to prioritize well in that state. You're not going to see clearly what to do and what not to do. And so I find gratitude, you wouldn't normally think about gratitude as a productivity hack. Um, but I think it is because it helps you to see what's good, what's working, what you want to build on. Uh, and helps you to, to know, look, I don't need to do 50 things today. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've been really reborn to this over these last few weeks that that if you really do three things that matter each day, let's say, you know, professionally in the business, three things, you say, okay, you've, you've calmed yourself enough, you relax enough so you know what three things are that matter and you do those three things and then you stop, then you relax and you're generous with your relaxation. You, you, you do almost mini vacation living. <laughs> it's amazing how much important things get done. Those are three things every day and you three more important things the next day and so on. And so within a five days, you have 15 things that are real, that really matter on your business. That's way more useful yeah. than, than a week's long where you're doing a bunch of stuff all the time, but the important things aren't getting your attention. It's, it's like, it's like, a, it's almost like discovering a secret passageway in an old house. You know, like when you're <laughs> a kid, you dream of like how cool it would be to find that little, you know, under, under the house and between, you know, these secret passageways. That's how it feels. I feel like it's almost like discovering a secret passageway yeah. uh, of life, of how to do work, how to live. Uh, and, and personally, having stumbled upon it, having discovered, I, I want no part, I don't want to go back at all. I have no interest in going back into sort of the, the rat race. How did somebody, excuse me, said to me recently, you know, I don't want to be the smartest rat in the room or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't want to go back into the rat race. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to live 
the way I've, other people are being told they have to be successful. There's a different path to, be, to, to create high contribution. And my priority project right now is to create an online essentialism class. Yeah. It doesn't sound that profound. Uh, it's kind of obvious. People have been asking me for years and years to do it. Uh, but here's what's great. It's not just, hey, we're going to do it. It's that I can say I'm going to do it now and I know it really will happen. That's, that's enjoyable. Yeah. Not just, oh, at some point, yeah, I'm doing this and it's going to get done. And what's even better than just that is that it's such a pleasure to be working on it with a feeling of like, because it's singular, because it's so focused, it's going to be good. You know, hopefully it'll be great. A uh, great thing about the online course, of course, is that you can keep improving it and, and, and tweaking it, improving over time. So whatever right. we start with, it'll be better a month later and two months later and 10 months later, and 10 years later. I, I love this. I'm so excited about doing it uh, and paying attention to everything. I was working with a web guy yesterday on it and, uh, and, and just the design of it and how we want to, the page to look and feel and to not do any of those things the rushed way. Yeah. Cause you have to, cause that's what entrepreneurs do. Just, just to do it in a way that, that you love every bit of it is a, uh, is a pleasure. I love that. And I look forward to when that course comes out and I'll be signing up and joining it for sure. Oh, I, I love that, Chris. First person <laughs> signed up. Yes. And I'm building it for you. Got what, me. Do, what do you want on it? What is it that you want in it that would make it great? Uh, Pretty much everything we talked about on here. <laughs> I, I already got the juicy questions out on you. Like, uh, I, I want to wrap up by by reading this passage towards the end of the book, and I feel like um, the audience would really like this, and it, it's really pretty profound. Um, so this is the essential life, living a life that really matters. Um, when I need to remember of this, I think of a story. It's about a man whose three-year-old daughter died. In his grief, he put together a video of her short little life. But as he went through all of, her, all of his home videos, he realized something was missing. He had taken video of everything, every outing they had gone on and every trip they had taken. He had lots of footage, but that wasn't the problem. Um, and that wasn't the problem. But then he realized that while he had plenty of footage of the places that he had gone, the sites that they had seen, and the views they had enjoyed, the meals they had eaten, and the landmarks they had visited, he had almost no close-up footage of his daughter herself. He had been so busy recording the surroundings, he failed to record what was essential. Um, this story captures the two most uh, the two most personal learnings that have come to me on on the long journey of writing this book. The first is the exquisitely important role of my family in my life. At the very, very end, everything else will fade into insignificance by comparison. And the second is the pathetically tiny amount of time we have left in our lives. For me, this is not a depressing thought, but a thrilling one. It removes fear of choosing the wrong thing. It infuses courage into my bones. It challenges me to be even more unreasonably selective about how to use this precious and precious as perhaps too insipid of a word time i know of someone who visits cemeteries around the world when he travels i thought this was odd at first but now i realize that this habit kept his own mortality in flow whatever decision or challenge or crossroads we face you face in your life simply ask yourself what is essential i love that man <laughs> um we're going to wrap up there, Greg. Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing up all your tips and tricks and wisdom with us. If the listeners want to reach out and learn more about your podcast, possibly uh, put them on suspense for the new book that's coming out, <laughs> uh, where can they find where can they find all your information at? Uh, I, I just essentialism.com. Just that one place is probably a, a, a good hub. Uh, and and as we as we evolve um that's people can be a part of that evolution there as well cool any final tips for the listeners before we wrap up um i well maybe it seems self-serving but i, I when you were reading that i felt quite touched by that myself and and uh, uh, just uh i mean just put those two together those two ideas uh the pathetically short amount of time mm -hmm. and the unevenly how unevenly important life is. Some people and activities are so much more important than others. If you put them together, you have, I mean, that is the evocative case for living as an essentialist. 
Uh, you can regret a lot of things. I mean, the person I'm talking about in that, in that story, the second person that goes to the cemeteries has passed away now. Mm. I mean, that's it. I mean, he, he, it's kind of powerful to hear that story again now that, that he's gone. Yeah. Uh, he was remembering that all the time. We, all of us will be gone and not very long from now. And we, won't, we all will have regrets. But choosing to be an essentialist, you know, that's not going to be one of them. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I feel myself inspired as we've had this conversation uh, to, to be more essentialist myself, to live by these things, uh, because this is, this is life. Uh, if, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. I love that. We'll wrap it up there. Listeners, thank you for tuning in once again. Greg, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you all in the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.